So among cetaceans, there's uh, several common distribution patterns. One of the most common is that of antropical distributions. And this is where related forms disperse to the northern southern hemispheres and then diverge there. And because of uh, seasonal uh, differences in the southern and southern, northern hemispheres, there's uh, the opportunity for uh, diverge, evolutionary divergence. In the southern hemisphere, there's no barriers to dispersal. So we often get forms that um, only exist in sort of one taxa in the southern hemisphere unless there's been uh, the invasion. However, because the uh, Isthmus of Panama closed approximately four million years ago, we'll often we'll see uh, two different forms uh, diverging in the northern and the northern Pacific and the northern Atlantic. Um, this pattern can be seen in several species. Uh, right whales are a great example. In the southern hemisphere, we have uh, one species of right whales, Eubalina australis. But in the northern hemisphere, there are two species, uh, one in the North Atlantic, uh, Glacialis, and then one in the North Pacific, Japonica. And these species have been verified by um, both nuclear and mitochondrial DNA. Uh, Minky whales show a similar pattern, except for they're on a taxonomic level below the species. So we have a southern hemisphere form that's unnamed. It's a unnamed subspecies. In the northern hemisphere, there are two uh, North Atlantic and North Pacific subspecies. Minky whales are slightly more interesting, though, because there is a, another full species in the southern hemisphere, the Antarctic minky. Uh, fin whales show a similar pattern. There's northern and southern hemisphere forms. And in the, uh, the 1930s, 1940s, examinations of whales caught during whaling operations showed that the southern hemisphere form was uh, slightly larger than the northern hemisphere form, uh, to, the, to the point where it got its own subspecies named Theonopter Physalis koi, the southern hemisphere of fin whale. Um, by rules of taxonomic naming, this left all northern hemisphere fin whales under what's called the nominate subspecies, or Physalis physalis. However, this name only really applies to the North, North Atlantic, and North, North Pacific and North Atlantic fin whales were never actually compared. Given that they're separated by uh, continents and the isthmus is closed, it's likely there's been diversification which has never <coughs> been tested genetically. So the question is, what's in the North Pacific? And that's what we've set out to do with genetics. Uh, we collected uh, about 153 samples. Most of it, most of them are from the uh, the North Pacific. Uh, 97 of them, uh, ranging from the uh, Gulf of uh, Mexico, California, up to the Bering Sea. We also have a fair sample size from the Western Atlantic, and we have uh, five samples from the Mediterranean and then several samples from the southern hemisphere, but most from uh, a single location collected over two years. So as we've been hearing, um, we've, we use mitochondrial DNA. It is uh, maternal inheritance and non-recombining, which can be good for this kind of phylogenetic study. The two studies that we've uh, heard about so far have been using a small, relatively small portion, about 400 to 1,000 base pairs, of the uh, what was called control region. However, we can now sequence the entire um, mitogenome uh, using what's called next generation sequencing. And that gives us about 16 times more data, going from 400 to 1,000 up to 16,000 base pairs. Uh, it also gives us um, the ability to examine different sorts of regions so we can get a, a better picture and, and uh, signal for um, different evolutionary pressures and rates. This gives us better taxonomic resolution, and you'll see this also in um, Bill's talk as well on killer whales. And um, the techniques have been evolving at a pace that it's, it's cost effective and efficient to do this for many samples. So, I use the word phylogenetics. Um, what it, what it is, is essentially the reconstruction of evolutionary patterns that is making a tree or seeing what the topology is of um, relationships between haplotypes. So as an example, imagine you have these five sequences. 
we can infer how they're related through a tree. And I'll just uh, go over a couple, some terminology we'll be using and we showing up in the next talk. We refer to the point at which sequences diverge as a node. And that's a, a the location of an estimated common ancestor between any uh, set of sequences. A set of sequences that, that form from a node we refer to as a clade. When we're examining um, sets of clades, one thing that we're interested in uh, to demonstrate that these clades have been separated for, uh, in, for a, a significant amount of evolutionary time are fixed differences. And these are, are locations along the sequence where all members of one clade share a base pair, but these two sequences share a C, to the exclusion of, of another clade where that base pair or that site is fixed in that clade. So this would be one fixed difference between this set of two and this, this clade of two and this clade of three. In phylogenetics, we can also estimate divergence uh, dates. That is the time in, in the past at which these nodes occurred. And that becomes um, useful in getting a sense for how long two clades have been uh, diverged. The method that we use is uh, referred to as a Bayesian method, and Bayesian methods are statistical um, uh, type of analysis uh, that are unique in that they allow us to take data from other studies to use as calibration points. So we can bring data forward into our studies, and then our studies become data that can be used in, in other studies. Um, and this data can come from anywhere from fossils, morphological data, other genetic studies. As an example, I'll show you this tree from a study by McGowan et al. on um, estimating the phylogenetic substitutions. This is just a subtree from a much larger tree showing the relationship of baleen lips. Um, he used uh, fossil calibration points for baleen whales and then inferred dates for nodes, um, and these gray bars represent the uncertainty around those, in those dates. Um, I'll draw your attention to where fin whales set. Um, they are most closely related to, fin, uh, to humpback whales. And uh, for our study, we would like, we, we wanted to use the estimated divergence states here, and as well, divergence states outside of this. By using more and more calibration points, it, makes, um, it gives uh, more and more certainty and anchors our study a little bit better. However, if we go out, you'll see that, that the clade of fin whales and humpback whales are more closely related to gray whales in his, in his analysis. Other analyses have shown that fin whales and humpbacks are more closely related to blues or to minkies. Some studies show that fins are more closely related to blues. So there's some taxonomic uncertainty at this higher level. And, and it's just a, a, a good um, point to show that it's important to have your taxonomy right. Barb will talk more about it. Uh, in, in her talk, but in for future studies, that kind of information can become important. We are only restricted to things that we have relatively high certainty about. So in our study, we only use divergence estimates between uh, fin whales and humpbacks. So here's our tree, the data, and I don't expect you to read all this. Um, I put this up to uh, to show that this upper bar is uh, the humpback outgroup. And so this is the divergence estimate between humpbacks and all fins at about 15 million years ago. And you'll see that the radiation of fins is happening much lower down, and it's a fairly rapid radiation or for all of our, our haplotypes, just to give you a, a sense of the scale of difference. If we look through um, our samples and we assign them to ocean basins, then we do see some clustering. Um, these are all of the North Pacific samples. There are three clusters here. Uh, the North Atlantic's all clustered together, and then the Southern Hemisphere is all clustered together. And uh, so what I'll do now is sort of collapse all these clays and show you a, a tree that's hopefully a little bit easier to read. And I'm going to walk through some of the uh, interesting features of this tree that, that we learned. Um, like I said, we have a radiation of the fin whale haplotypes at about two million years, um, with the, the first group breaking out being uh, these North Pacifics. Most of our samples from the North Pacific were in this one clade. 
We have uh, a, another uh, clade that, that appears to be the, diverse, the, the, the diversification of the, um, or the breaking out of the North Atlantic haplotypes. All of the North Atlantic haplotypes were here, um, breaking out at about 800,000 uh, years, close to a million years. There's a small group of North Pacific samples here. Um, this placement is relatively uncertain in our analysis. I won't be talking about them anymore. But then we have the diversification of all the southern hemispheres at about 700, 800 million years, which is 800,000 years ago. The most interesting um, feature of this tree is one we didn't expect at all, and it's this node down here. At about 400,000 years ago, it appears that there was a reinvasion of southern hemisphere fin whales into, back into the North Pacific. Um, we have about 14 haplotypes uh, or samples from the North Pacific that are most closely related to southern hemisphere fin whales. And again, just to make sure to clarify, these are samples that were taken in the North Pacific. So their half, their half, their, their mitochondrial, mitochondrial genomes are more closely related to, that, to southern hemisphere fin whales than they are to any other North Pacifics. So in order to you know, examine sort of how, how distinct they are, we've seen how they're related, we look, like I said, at these fixed differences. And if we look at the relationship between, um, or the number of fixed differences between these clades, we come up with some in interesting patterns. Uh, the first is that those North Atlantic samples are very distinct from the other two ocean basins. So I can take a North Atlantic sample and, make, and, and tell it apart from either North Pacific or Southern Hemisphere samples. However, the Southern Hemisphere and the North Pacific taken as a whole are not distinct. There's no fixed differences between them. And that's due, of course, to that, um, those, that clade, those two clades of North Pacific samples that are separate from the main North Pacific A. But if I look and split clade A and clade C apart, they are very distinct from the Southern Hemisphere. However, the, the most number of fixed differences is between the two North Pacific clades. So that's a very good sign that there are two natural lines in the North Pacific that have a very, very long and old evolutionary history. And then the final thing I want to point out is that the control region, that this region that we've heard about before, of this shorter sequence, it's not, there's not many fixed differences. So if we just looked at clade C to the southern hemisphere, there's zero, while in the whole mitochondria genome, there are 13. And this means that there's a lot more taxonomic information in that whole line genome and, and gives sort of evidence to why we want to, to collect more sequences, why we want to do the entire line genome when we're looking at questions like this. So this question of sort of um, how different they are, we can approach in a different way, especially since we're interested in, in subspecies. And this goes to an, uh, an idea of diagnosability. And it's the, um, the ability to correctly classify an unknown specimen to its, its ocean base of origin. So you can imagine if you go into a museum, open a drawer, pull out a skull, you know, a fin whale skull, and, <laughs> and say, I want to know which, thing, which ocean basin this came from based on some features. Um, it, that's a standard way of um, measuring subspecies. If you can do that with about 97% certainty, then you can you, you've got, uh, you, can, you can have rest, of, you can have high confidence that this thing is at least existing as, as a subspecies, different enough to be called a subspecies. Unfortunately, there's no method available for sequence data. The, all the methods that have been available have been used for, um, developed for morphological data and some for, uh, for nuclear markers, but not for sequence data. So we've had to turn to a method that um, is developed in 2001 called random cars, and it's been getting a lot of traction, but this is the first time, as far as we know, that it's been applied to this kind of data. And it's a classification method that allows us to measure diagnosability among ocean basins. It creates a classification engine for haplotypes, so it's, it's an algorithm. You can take a new haplotype and it will tell us what ocean basin it came from. It also provides an estimate of error, so we can know how certain we are of that classification. Um, so when we apply it to this data, 
uh, we get a table like this where the rows are where the pathogens were sampled from and the columns are what they got classified as from the random forest algorithm. And you can see that the, the diagonal is a thing to pay attention to. We have very high classification for almost all ocean basins. In fact, the only place we have an error is in the North Pacific, and it's for the two haplotypes. And those end up being these two North haplotypes here. So although we don't have what's called um, reciprocal monophyly, that is, we don't have all ocean basins in their own clay, but we have this split between the North Pacifics, we do have high classification ability, 98%. And that crosses that bar for um, this, the, the standard bar for subspecies. So, in conclusion, this, from the study, we see a, um, we have a relatively rapid radiation into ocean basins for fin whales. Um, we found this uh, evidence of this, this re invasion, which is, is quite interesting. Um, strong diagnosability of these ocean basins. And all of this is consistent with the, the fact that the, the idea that North Pacific fin whales are a separate subspecies from the North Atlantic and the Southern Hemisphere. But there are some things we, we still need to do. Um, this tree is based on um, a, a small number on, on a small number of outgroup sequences, that is the humpback. If we have more humpback sequences, we can refine it, get better estimates. Um, and our geographic coverage is, does not encompass all regions for which fin whales are known to occur. We're missing uh, samples from the South Pacific and uh, from the South Atlantic and, and from and, and a large portion of the Southern Hemisphere. I'd like to beef that up. Um, it is only from the mitochondrial DNA, although it is 16,000 base pairs, it is just one marker. We'd like to. Um, look at this, the, the, the patterns relationship for nuclear loci. And we're also interested in bringing in acoustics and seeing how, um, the, if that gives us uh, any other information. There's some intriguing um, data from uh, acoustic measurements in the North Pacific that shows multiple call types. And, and we're interested if that's related to, in any way, uh, having these uh, multiple macro lines there as well. Uh, we'd like to test this classification engine on, on both our simulated data and new data sets uh, so we can see how it performs with, with this genetic data. And then once we have this subspecies level uh, taken care of, we're then interested in going in and looking at population structure in the North Pacific. Um, that's going to take more, um, more possibly more samples and, and taking different regions, different times, and more data as well. So I'd also like to acknowledge collaborators and, and other people that help with samples, and especially when we get into these, uh, these next generation sequencing and the amount of data that gets generated. It is very much a, a team effort. Um, and thank you for your time. And thank you. Type B and C North Pacific fin whale. Is there any suggestion of them being geographically separated from the type A? Um, so it's clays. There's just the natural ones, and not really. I mean, what I didn't claim, what is hard to see, is if, if you look at that that big tree where you have all the samples. Um, the sampling locations are all over the place in the North Pacific. There are some frequency differences. I think it's that clay C. Has, is sampled at a higher frequency north of Point Conception and Clay A at a, a higher frequency south of Point Conception, one way or the other. Um, but it's, it, there, there are frequency differences. They occur together. Um, we sample them together at the same sampling bout. So there doesn't seem to be any strict biogeographic structuring of those claims. Yeah. Something about the name, the re in the North Pacific. I've started looking at it and I haven't found anything specifically. Um, it's there's there these trans equatorial crossings 
um, has been reported for other, um, uh, especially baleen whales, and they, they report, I think, uh, pinky whales um, having these, these crossings. And it's, it, it's a question both of having the crossing and then you know, the stochastic process of it getting into the population and having successful migration. Um, but no, I haven't, and it's mainly just because I haven't taken the time to, to do all of the, the paleoceanographic reading to see it, but it is, it is possible, yes. Yes? I couldn't tell from the map, but did you have any samples from the Western Rockies? Um, one. 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 And it clustered with the other North Pacific samples deeply. There's, it didn't stand out as anything unusual. Did the, the invasion, you said the ocean invasion is going to be population based the Atlantic? So does this correlate with other species like pink whales or some type of species? Other so, whales? So, so you were just talking about possible oceanographic changes. I was just wondering, if, are there are there analogous invasions for other for other species like meat whales and blue whales? We see there. The blue whale picture is messy, um, and I haven't seen any publications that show this clear. Um, sorry, uh, <laughs> this clear evidence of like we can make an estimate of when you know that invasion happened. I haven't seen it sort of that clear, so I, I don't I, I don't know the information is there. Yes. Is there any evidence of isolation in the Gulf of California or Mediterranean samples? No, that's uh, the other thing I didn't mention. Those Gulf of California samples we had about 13, 13 20 of them. Um, they're spread throughout the tree, and the Mediterranean sample is spread in the Atlantic as well. So, no. uh, I think we're on so let's turn it over.